Uh, Lionel, I know that you're in a session uh, later on in the festival called We Need to Talk About America, but we don't want to share you with anyone else today. We've got you all to ourselves. And I do remember that last time you were here, which I think was about four years ago, you were pretty hard on Hillary Clinton. You didn't think that she... Um, she should win, and indeed, uh, your wish was granted. Uh, but I was wondering whether you um, had an opinion of how you think she's doing as Secretary of State. I think the answer is okay. She's doing okay. <laughs> I, I can see that when uh, Obama gave her that position, I was hurt um, because she lost. Uh, and it was, it, it was overcompensation, in my view. But, uh, you know, she's done a reputable job. Uh, I would call it a workmanlike job, but she hasn't embarrassed us. And after the Bush administration, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, talking about embarrassment then, um, again, four years ago when we spoke, Sarah Palin was something that we could not have conceived of. Even you, I don't think, could not have conceived of Sarah Palin. <laughs> Um, so, what, what was your response to that phenomenon? Loathing. <laughs> <laughs> Loathing and, and, yes, lots of embarrassment. I mean, certainly on an international level, she makes the United States look uh, foolish. I mean, beyond foolish. Like, what is this? It's a, it's a farce. And, you know, her conduct through the campaign was, uh, was appalling. She knew nothing. Uh, she had no business running for dog catcher. <laughs> and, and yet now she's become a uh, major player mm. on the national stage. Mm. And we have yet to see whether she will have the chutzpah to run for president. Mm. Mm. Well, you like fuss, so to some extent that may entertain you further down the line. You know, my sense of humor is not that good. <laughs> <laughs> In case you're wondering about the gloves, we may come to the gloves later, so um, just put that on notice. Okay, final woman of the trio that mm -hmm. I have to ask you about. I'm really interested in, in the way America has gone nuts over Michelle Obama, and I'm just wondering whether you can say what you as an American want from a first lady. This is gonna sound, uh, this is gonna sound bad. <laughs> <laughs> but to know her place. The point being, uh, we don't elect a first lady. Hmm. And I, I thought that uh, Clinton treating his wife when he was president as if she were an elected official who should be taking on official duties and responsibility for legislation was anti-democratic. You know, that's, hmm. that's what you do in a monarchy. Uh, <laughs> and I think Michelle Obama has, has got it just right that, uh, uh, she does volunteer work, she um, takes on causes, uh, she's an, uh, she acts as an emissary for the U.S., uh, she's an, an inspirational figure, and she's charming. I wish she couldn't be doing it better. Mm, okay, good. Well, at least someone gets your approval. <laughs> Given what you were saying earlier, though, I think that those of us who've, who've read and, and enjoyed your books um, would agree that they are often very passionate and uh, angry, I think is the word that I would use. Um, and I, I remember talking a few years ago to Jonathan Franzen and him using a really lovely phrase where he, he was talking, we were talking about depression, in fact, and he, he said that depression was the sponsor of his writing, which I thought was a wonderful way of putting that particular relationship. I was wondering whether you could talk about anger as fuel and about how you feed your anger and then how you harness the anger and, and know where to direct it and know that that anger will sustain for the duration of writing a novel. Well, I think anger is a, can be a very productive emotion. It has, uh, it has energy in it, mm. right? It, it, it fires you up. Uh, and it, it's, it, it certainly is productive in prose because it has huge amounts of forward motion. Um, it has its pitfalls. Uh, impotent anger, this kind of spitting, spewing uh, bitterness mm. can, can eat the prose up and cer can certainly eat the characters up. And there's one 
character in my new novel um, who, who is furious about the way things work. But yes, it does. It consumes him in a way. It starts out festive anger uh, uh, in, in, in an ex in ideologically uh, imaginative and uh, exploratory anger. Mm. And as the book goes on and his life becomes uh, more dire, that becomes much more bitterness, sourness, um, and and that's less attractive anger, and, mm. and it's destructive for the for the character. And I think that as an author, I have to watch that too. I mean, you don't you don't want to just be so so angry at the state of things that you're unpleasant company, <laughs> and. Um, and that's where a sense of humor comes into play. Mm, yeah, which I'm going to get to, but I just want to know a little bit more about your own anger, because I was trying to imagine whether when you were um, writing this book, I was trying to, to, fight, to sort of imagine whether you were the sort of person who shouts back at the television, for example. Oh, yes. You do? You don't want to watch the news with me. <laughs> and are you the kind of person who goes on demos or marches? I mean, are you a kind of engaged activist sort of a person? I mean, did you march in Britain against the war? No, I didn't. I wasn't, um, I w wasn't there when the big march on Iraq occurred, so that's excuse. Um, no, I'm not. I was when I was a teenager, uh, a, a big activist. I, I grew up at the tail end of the 60s, so that was, that was the done thing. I don't feel especially in, inventive in, in having gone to anti-Vietnam marches. I figure I do my bit in the books, and mm. uh, and no, I, I'm not really keen on showing up at demonstrations and, and waving signs. But what's making not you, my style. What's making you angry right now in the world? I mean, there's so much to pick from, but I mean, in, <laughs> in terms of your particular focus, I'm, I'm interested in what particular thing is just really getting your dander up. Oh, well, this could get me in terrible trouble. Um, I'm exasperated with immigration, uh, in particular in the United States. Um, and I, I'm, I'm reluctant to get into this territory because it's... You it's, could be cooking this up for the next book? Yes, either the next book or the one after. Okay. So I, I don't want to go too far into it, but uh, it's very frustrating to come from a country that, uh, because it has a mythology about itself, that it's a, quote, nation of immigrants is now, it's, it's completely uncool to enforce its own immigration policy. So we just have people pouring in illegally from uh, our southern border, and there's nothing to do about it. And I feel very conflicted about this issue, and that's why mm. I'm interested in eventually writing about it, because I'm also very sympathetic with people who are crossing the border. Mm. You know, I understand why they're doing it, and I know that if I were born in Mexico, I'd come up north too. Um, so do you write your books to find out what you think about something? Yes, yes. I, I mean, that, that sense of conflict. And I'm, I'm just, I really go back and forth on, on, on this stuff as to where my sympathies lie. Uh, and that's why it's an interesting topic for me. It is, and, and it's something that I've been thinking a lot about too, having spent a couple of months in Britain at the end of last year, and also obviously it's a very big topic here, and it doesn't seem to me that there's any safe, neutral space where no, we can isn't. have this conversation publicly amongst ourselves without immediately being labeled one thing or the other. Oh yeah, and whenever I open my mouth about this issue, I feel, have this feeling of watch your back. Mm. Mm. Okay, well this is a nice way then of, of uh, maybe leading into, you've, you've already mentioned Jackson, your, your ranter character, who I kind of imagine as being um, in, in this book, so much for that, closest to you. Mm. Um, he has this great definition of the way um, society is divided up into mugs and mooches, and for the benefit of people who haven't read the book yet, would you like to just expand a little bit or define what, a, what makes a mug and what makes a mooch? Uh, well, in my... Friend Jackson's view: the world, the Western world, is divided into mugs and mooches, and the mugs are um, are people like him. It's people who get with the program, who uh, obey the law, do what they're told, pay their taxes, work hard, and are punished for it. 
<laughs> and the mooches are savvy, right? They know how things work. They're not, not so stupid as to um, work hard and, and then sacrifice the better part of their disposable income for God knows what. Um, and they're the people who know who, how to play the system. And, and there are, there's a long list of, of who these people are, and interestingly, it's on the top and the bottom. So it's, it's not just uh, welfare cheats, you know, or people who live on, on state benefits, but it's also, you know, the bankers and, and other people who know how to play the system from the top, uh, from, a, from a position of, of advantage. And of course, first and foremost, anybody who works in government or for government is a mooch. <laughs> can you vacillate? Can you, can you go from being a, a mug about some things to being a mooch about others? Or are you definitely in one camp or the other? You can go back and forth a little bit, but it's a, really a matter of temperament. And uh, I think that you're temperamentally either a mug or a mooch. And I am interested in the way that uh, that responsibility and hard work, uh, if nothing else because of a so-called progressive tax system, is, is punished in Western countries. And um, I think part of, the, part of the anger there is that I have recently had the privilege of graduating to a tax bracket <laughs> <laughs> where I feel, I feel the pinch. And Congratulations. Yet, and, yet I, and yet I can point to very little that, that I get for, that, for all that lost income. I just, and it's especially enraging in the United States where I don't even live, uh, but the U.S. expects me to pay very large taxes. And, I, and that's part of what Jackson is upset about. It's so not, just pay, not just what he sacrifices, but how little he gets back. If you're paying taxes in two countries, that makes you a double mug. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm a double mug. A double and, mug. And, and, you know, don't get me wrong. I, I, I do everything I'm told. So it's part of what's going on with Jackson and me through Jackson um, is that resentment of one's own pliability, you know, that, that, and fearfulness. Because mm. what, what makes mugs mugs is not so much that they're good people and they, they're, they're righteous and, and they care about others. It's that they're terrified, right? That's why tax systems work. <laughs> you don't want to get in trouble. Well, that's not entirely fair, because Jackson's argument is that you do also want some of the benefits. You believe in sidewalks. You believe in public transport. You're a cyclist. For God's sake, you believe in cycle tracks. Yes, but one of the things that he points out is that um, the things that you actually benefit from uh, in, in taxes are provided primarily by municipal authorities, which, as he says, take such a small slice of the pie that on a plate it would fall over. <laughs> now, one of the, the most powerful allies that you harness um, uh, to your anger so successfully in all of your books is humor, and I don't think that that is recognized enough. But I was just wondering whether you could tell us who your... Um, favorite satirists are? I mean, are you a, a Colbert fan? Are you a John Stewart fan? Or is it more Ricky Gervais? I mean, who are the people who, for you, managed to kind of have or share your, your subversive sense of comedy? Oh, you're going to have to help me out here. Um, are you a Mike a... Moore fan? Sorry? Mike Moore? I like some of Michael Moore. Uh, I find uh, he's sometimes too broad uh, and too partisan. Uh, sometimes when he gets on... Um, he gets on his high horse on a particular subject. Uh, it it's a little, it's actually a little humorous. Mm. Uh, but I liked Sicko. I thought that was his best work. And uh, for some reason, he and I are dovetailing each other because he mm. also did that a Columbine film, yeah. and then I did Kevin. I, I, uh, we're, we're kind of shadowing each other, and then he came along with Sicko when I was already starting in on this. Uh, but but for once, I th I thought that was focus. If for for more, it was restrained, uh, which is meaning that he stayed on subject, uh, and and I shared his outrage. Mm. 
But are there satirists that you follow that you feel are kind of expressing your point of view or your take on life? Well, when I said help me out here, there's a, there's a duo on Rory Bremner. Do you get Bro Rory Bremner here? Mm, I'm not sure we do any more, and if so, only on cable. So I won't know who you're talking about. Well, that's about. not going to help. They're, hilar <laughs> they're hilarious. Okay. Very dry. Very so dry. are you finding that, that there's a kind of sharper satire that you can identify with in Britain than, say, in the US? Yes. Yeah, I think I, I, there's, a, there's a tradition of, of political satire in the UK that I resonate with. And in the US, it's, it's, it's broader. The Daily Show turns me off. It's, uh, I just don't find it that funny. Mm. And again, it's, 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 it's funny in a very partisan way and, and in a clubby way. Mm. And the assumption with The Daily Show is that you're all on the same side. It's what annoys me about liberals in general. Conservatives, uh, uh, as a type, do not assume when they meet someone that you are also a conservative. They tend to be a little more careful and feel you out. Because they're more paranoid, they feel marginalized. And... But liberals are presumptuous. Mm. And especially if you seem like a halfway decent human being, the assumption is, of course, you're wildly left-wing. And, uh, and, and that's what The Daily Show does. It's like we're all in the same little club mm. and it's mm. very self-congratulatory and, and I don't care for that. Because I was thinking about the fact that you've said several times um, that Joseph Heller's Catch-22 was the kind of seminal book for you when mm -hmm. you were growing up. Um, and that makes sense in terms of, of uh, your work. But um, I was interested in the fact that recently in a column in The Guardian, you also wrote about the affinity that you feel with Edith Wharton. Mm. And the moment you said it, it made absolute sense. If one, if one reads your work thinking about that, it absolutely correlates. But um, did Edith no, Wharton... No, that's a big leap from Joseph Howard. It is, it is, it is. But just stay with me, work with me here. Um, I like it, and I want to see where you're going. <laughs> well, I want to ask you whether you think Edith Wharton had a sense of humor, because I don't think she did. No. No, no, I don't remember chuckling over Age of Innocence. <laughs> but she, she has a lot of other things going for her. She was a great uh, analyst of character. Mm. Uh, what I especially admire about her work is the elegance of elegance and intelligence of the prose. It, it and yet it, it's it's elegant in an understated way, and I don't find that she writes the kind of books where you're supposed to be sitting there thinking, "Gosh, you know, isn't she a great writer?" And that's not what I I want you to think when you, you're reading my books either. I would rather you think. I wonder what happens next. This character is driving me insane. Um, or that's so true. Hmm. Right? And that's what I, I really like about her work, that it's, it doesn't call attention to itself. It's beautifully done, but it doesn't call attention to itself. It just leads you effortlessly into story and character. And in other words, as well as she writes, content comes first. Mm. And, and, and that's the level in which I would really identify with her. Illness, the big theme of so much for that, um, does not uh, leave a lot of room for humor. I mean, when someone gets diagnosed with a condition like Glynis, your central character, who suffers from mesothelioma, there isn't much room for cracking a joke around Glynis. Do you get the feeling that Glynis oh, yes, would actually appreciate it <laughs> if someone did come into the sick room and crack a joke? I mean, do you think that's partly what she would, she's hankering for in all that sort of reverential uh, treatment that she gets from friends? Oh, I think that one of the things that must drive people crazy when they're sick is this kind of tippy-toeing mm. and, and, and oppressive sobriety, you know? <laughs> um, Oh, I'm so glad that it seems you're feeling better. Um, and it, it would drive me nuts. And uh, I would find someone who came in and cracked a joke uh, incredibly refreshing. If Did I, you if ever I try that? I mean, I know that Glynis is based partly on, on your, your friend Terry, who died of um, cancer, someone that you met as a um, fellow metal worker in a class that you mm -hmm. were doing together. Did you ever crack a joke with Terry? Not enough. And I think that one of the reasons that it was difficult for 
us to joke is that, like my character Glennis, and it's one of the things that I wanted to examine when I wrote this book, uh, my friend uh, Terry refused to admit that she was dying. Mm -hmm. Now she had mesothelioma, which is uh, incurable, and, um, and it was a death sentence. But because uh, her doctors were pouring so much resources into her uh, surgery and then horrible series of chemotherapy treatments, I mean, there's a certain logic to that. I mean, why, why, would you, why would you do all that if it didn't work? Hmm. So it leads you into this uh, deceitful hopefulness. Hmm. Um, and in my friend's case, I, th I think that was tragic because I, it deprived everyone. She was going to die anyway. I mean, let's just be brutal about it. And she was going to die very soon. It, it, even this, this thing about, oh, the, 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 the treatment, of, uh, why would they be doing the treatment if it didn't work? It even worked on me because there was a, there was a middle period when she had one uh, CAT scan that was promising a, 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 some of the cancer had shrunk a bit and everyone around her uh, was so eager to interpret this as, as good news and, and therefore to because mm -hmm. it was only delay. It was a very small delay. Um, and it made it possible for me to be um, more cavalier about letting a couple weeks go by uh, before I picked up the phone, because, well, God, Terry's getting better. Mm. Uh, and I think it was really rough on her marriage, I, uh, because, as it is rough on the marriage in the book, there's a, there's a, a big lie uh, going on, so that it, it, it alienates the spouses. Mm. Uh, and I, I think most painfully, it means that uh, her husband, uh, Shep in the book uh, is unable to talk to her mm. about what life is going to be like for him when when she's dead. Mm. And it's interesting. I was talking to somebody uh, in a similar position uh, just the other day, whose husband has brain cancer, and she feels so guilty because she inevitably starts thinking about what it's going to be like for her when he's no longer around. Mm. Well, you know, this is. This, this is what people do. Uh, you think into the future, you can't help yourself, but it feels like betrayal. And uh, when, when Glynis doesn't allow her husband to discuss the fact that she's dying, he can't get her permission to, to have these, what to, are to him, evil thoughts in his head. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they can't really talk. And I think that this whole business of, of, of false hope, you know, live, living, living in a, um, a medically unreal universe, uh, means that you, you, don't, you, you cannot be intimate with the people mm -hmm. who know the truth. And you can't even be intimate with yourself. And that may be the, the greatest loss of all. And I felt that with, with my friend, who wouldn't admit she was dying, that there was a way that she couldn't address herself to the meaning of her life, to her own feelings about her death. In fact, she was denying, she was denied her own death as mm -hmm. an experience. I mean, it is, I haven't been there yet, but it is, it is a big part of life. It's a major moment in your experience of the world. It is your last opportunity to think. To me, that is the, um, that is the one promise of having a terminal illness rather than, you know, stepping off a curb and getting run over by a bus. That you have the opportunity to think. And that was the one thing that I would covet for myself if, if I had to go through that. I'm interested in the fact that um, as well as giving us glynis and mesothelioma and this terrible process that she has to go through, you give us another illness, which most of us have never heard of. Mm. I'm going to try and say it right. Familial dysautonomia. Well done. Thank you. Um, tell me why you decided that you wanted to introduce a character who had another illness, which is 
as bad, if not worse, particularly since in this case it's suffered by a very lippy adolescent. Mm. Um, what, what were you doing there structurally when you, when you added that second illness to the mix and how did you choose the illness? Okay, well, this novel has three different subplots in it. Um, they are all medical in nature. You can call that schematic, but a book is supposed to be about something in particular. And this is a medical book. This is about medical issues. And uh, I didn't find that uh, a big strain to uh, establish three different medical subplots because, after all, medicine is a part of everyone's life. Uh, everyone has medical issues, so it, it wasn't hard. Um, Shep has uh, an elderly father who has a fall and then is subsequently uh, put into a nursing home and gets one of those hospital infections. Um, then there's uh, the familial dysautonomia story. Jackson has, has this kid with a genetic condition, and it's awful. And then the, my third subplot, which is, has to be my favorite, and I'm, I'm not going to give any more away about it. We will it. get there. But um, it's uh, plastic surgery goes wrong. <laughs> In a very sensitive part of the body. Yes. Now, as for the FD, as it's abbreviated, uh, I actually went shopping for, for illness. Um, <laughs> and I, I wanted it to be um, expensive. I wanted it to be terminal. And I also wanted it to be relatively unknown. So I asked a number of uh, pediatricians what they would suggest. And somebody came up with familial dysautonomia. I thought it was a good thing that I'd never heard of it. Um, and then I, I started looking it up on the internet, and then um, the symptoms, are, they're just bizarre, because it has to do with the dysfunction of the so-called autonomic system, which I'd never heard of, uh, which is essentially controls everything about your body that you're supposed to not have to think about, like temperature, uh, bl blood pressure, Sweating and, and drooling and crying. Yeah, and and, and crying. Or These tearing. Kids, tear ducts. One of the first uh, one of the first indicators that your kid has FD is that they that you they can't cry. <laughs> <laughs>